Good morning. It's wonderful to be in the presence of our Lord this morning. We should come to church to be with the Lord. Amen. The Bible tells us in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And we exceed those requirements of two or three this morning. Amen. Through the Spirit of God, He is with us. Let's ask God's blessing upon the worship hour. Please, if you would, bow your, bow your head for a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you in prayer. Praise your holy name. Father, just thank you so much for all you do for us. Father, as, as we celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday, Father, every day is a day that we should be thankful in all things. You tell us that in your word. And, Fathers, we gather together in your storehouse with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we just thank you so much for the freedom to do that. We live in a country where we have that freedom. It's come at a high cost. Many have perished, lost their life to fight for the freedom that we uh, take for granted today. Thank you, Father, for uh, having your word so readily available. Father, your Bible, your word is, is, uh, can be found just about in any store. We thank you, Father, for that. We thank you for each one that come out today. And Father, now we ask by the power of your spirit that you guide and direct us unto truth, that you speak to hearts. I pray, Father, for being one today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you'd draw them unto yourself, and Father, that they would be saved today. And I do pray for the believer. I pray that each one of us would, uh, that you'd search our heart out, and Father, that we might consider and think about how you have worked in our life in the past and how you've brought us to where we are today. And Father, we all fall short of where we need to be. So Father, forgive us. But yet, Father, challenge us in truth today that we could draw closer to you and that we be a usable people, Father, to, to spread your word throughout a lost and dying world. And, Father, I do pray for the lost today. I pray, Father, that you'd soften those hearts. There's many people, Father, that have heard the gospel multiple times and they've turned it away. They've turned it away. They've turned away the calling upon them, Father. And we just pray that you'd soften that heart and give them one more opportunity before it's too late. And Father, have your way now. We'll give you the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> the title of the message this morning is Thankfulness. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know, through loss in our life, through pain and suffering and life's challenges, it's hard sometimes to be thankful in all things, isn't it? It's hard. But even in those times, uh, there's something in it to be thankful for. It could always be worse. It could always be worse. There's people all around us that uh, are suffering, and uh, there's no hope for them. And uh, there's so many things that we should be thankful for. Uh, let's start with a personal question this morning. Have you been in the mind of being thankful during this holiday of Thanksgiving? We should be. Has it been just another holiday, a day to eat, a day to shop, a day to hunt, to visit? Many of us have enjoyed a lot of good food, amen, possibly. Uh, many of us have been cooking, hunting, shopping, and visiting, doing all those things. But we should focus on what we have and not what we don't have or what we want. Amen? Amen? You know, we think we deserve anything and everything that we just think of. We should just, we should just have it. You know, in this country, we are spoiled. Amen? Amen. Yes. You know, we've just got so many things. God has blessed us and blessed us and blessed this country. Yes, I know there's people hurting in this country. I, I know that. I know there's people suffering. I know there's people that don't have a lot of food. There's people that don't have a home. There's a lot of people that are in dire need of many things. But in general, as a whole, this country, we're all blessed. I think we'd all have to agree on that. Amen. 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. When you think about that, every day of our life, we should be in a, in a, 
attitude and a heart and mind to be thankful to our Lord, to know Him. He is good. His mercy endure forever. You know what? I've said this a lot of times. I'm thankful that I don't get what I deserve. You know, we all like to think we're doing the best we can and we're doing good, but you know what? There's nobody that don't deserve anything but the pits of hell. It's all by the grace of God that we're saved. It's by His grace that we have what we have. He meets our needs according to His riches and glory. We like to think, well, I bought this and I've earned that. To done all that. If God hadn't given you the ability and the opportunity, you wouldn't have any of those things. Amen. We are nothing without Him. As a child of God, it's not about how many toys we have or good times that we experience in this life, but what we do with and for Jesus Christ. We should be living our life for His glory. Amen. This morning, let's look into God's Word as to meeting God with gratitude, meaning being thankful. You know, in this country today, is people very thankful for what they have? It's a very good question. We'll be turning to Luke chapter 17, looking at verses 11 through 19. Uh, this story speaks volumes to me, and I hope that it speaks to you this morning. Verse 11 and 12, we'll look at, uh, read it. And it came to pass as he, talking about Jesus, went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Jesus entered into a certain village. There met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Here we read where Jesus meets ten lepers. They're called lepers because they had a disease called leprosy. Leprosy was the most terrible disease in Jesus' day. You know, we read about leprosy in multiple places in the Word of God. Leprosy is disease in humans, also known as Hansen's disease. It's called by Bacillus Mycobacterium leprae, if that makes sense to you. The word leprosy is not an accurate medical definition, but it's been adopted as a description word for it. It's basically a skin disease that eats the flesh away. In ancient times, people with leprosy were considered an outcast and unclean. They were banished as an outcast, totally ostracized from society, earthly and heavenly. These outcast lepers lived and traveled together because they were rejected by society completely. Some more information about it. I want you to understand what leprosy is. William Barclay described what a leper looks like. The whole appearance of the face is changed till the man loses his human appearance. Leprosy has or was nodules or blisters that grow larger and larger. They ulcerate and they ooze and they discharge fluid and it has a very foul odor. It's nasty. People in this condition, their eyebrows fall out, their eyes become staring. The voice becomes hoarse and the victim wheezes because of the ulceration of the vocal cords. Not a very pleasant thing as we picture this, is it? The hands and the feet also ulcerate. Slowly the sufferer becomes a, a mass of just ulcerated gross. And that oozes and, and pus runs out and fluid runs out and they become, they stink. The average course of the disease is nine years and it ends in a mental decay, a coma, and ultimately death comes to them. The sufferer becomes ultimately, ultimately repulsive both to himself and to others. Nobody wanted to be around these people. Even if they knew somebody in this condition, they didn't want to be in contact with it. They didn't want to catch it. They stayed away from them. How terrible that would be to have that. And you see your loved ones, you see your countrymen, you see your people, and you want to be there, you want to be with them. And they shun you and they turn their back on you. And you're outcast. How terrible that would be. How that would break your heart and how it would bother you psychologically and knowing that there's no hope. How terrible it would be. 
Anyone with leprosy by Levitical law was considered unclean, an outcast. They were repulsive. They were disgusting to society. How sad. I'm sure from the description in that reading that after a period of time that you get to the point you could recognize who they were. By, Lev by Levitical law in Leviticus chapter 13, and we'll read these verses 43 through 46, if you'd like to turn there, I'll have him putting it on the overhead. It makes it a little easier for some people, but it's no substitute for your Bible. It says, Then the priest shall look upon it. Behold, if the rising of the sore be white, reddish in his bald head, or in his bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh. Verse 44 says, He is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. His Plague is in his head. Verse 45 says, And the leper whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, Unclean, unclean, unclean. Verse 46, it says, All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean, he shall dwell alone, Without the camp shall his habitation be. To be outcast, to be identified that way and to have to cover their lip with cloth and if anybody was around, they'd have to, by law, they'd have to holler unclean, 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 unclean. To give a warning, stay away from me, stay away from me, I'm unclean. How sad that would be. You know, another notable thing about this that made it even worse. It was thought of by the Jews that leprosy was caused because of sin. How sad it would be if you've got leprosy and then everybody's looking at you and saying, Oh, what did you do? What did you do? It must have been really bad to have this. As God has cursed you with this disease of leprosy, what did you do? What did your family do? It was not only an outward thing and a health thing, but it was also an inner thing that would be so troubling. Let's continue with verse 13 of our reading. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. As we're looking here, Jesus sees these ten lepers and they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Notice their voices. They all recognized Jesus. They all cried out. They all addressed him as Master. They was asking him, begging for mercy. Mercy from what? This dreadful disease. This bondage from humanity. This bondage from worship. They was needing mercy mercy they knew Jesus was a miracle healer he could cleanse them physically they had a need and they knew that he could supply that need let's look at verse 14 and when he saw them he said unto them go show yourselves unto the priest and it came to pass that as they went they were cleansed they obeyed the command. They didn't question him. They didn't stutter about it. They had enough faith to believe Jesus said to go see the priest. And they immediately was obedient. And they turned and they was headed. And they was headed to the priest. Jesus didn't say why to go to the priest. He didn't tell them to do anything. He didn't tell them to say anything. He just said go see the priest. That was good enough. They took Jesus at his word, didn't they? Let's take a really close look at these next couple of verses for just a moment. Look at verses 15 and 16 with me. Verse 15, it says, One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice he glorified God. So out of obedience, they turned from Jesus. They're headed. They're all ten going to the priest. It doesn't say how far they went or how long they'd been gone. It didn't say that. In my mind, I don't think it went very far. 
I don't think he had to go very far. It was an act of being obedient. It was an act of having faith and taking God at his word, just like we need to take God at his word today. Amen? This one, he saw, he looked down, and he was healed. Can you imagine how he felt? Wow, how excited he must have been. How long had he had this dreadful disease? In a reading uh, up to this said most people lived up to nine years with it. So uh, we don't know how long he had had it, but we know he was up against it. And he realized, he's healed me. He healed me. He healed me. And look at verse 16. In verse 15 it says, And he turned back, and with a loud voice he glorified God. He glorified God. Thank you, God. You have cleansed me. You have healed me. And then verse 16 says, And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him what? Thanks. Giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Immediately, immediately, one of the, only one of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, he responded by turning back to Jesus. And with that loud voice, he glorified God. He fell down. And he did that. He was a Samaritan. Samaritans was the most despised, the most rejected by men. They didn't even associate with the Jews. But yet, he was the most thankful. Imagine that. Look at verse 17 through 19. And Jesus answered, he says, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. The one thankful leper came that day to be physically healed, but he received a whole lot more, didn't he? He was spiritually healed. He received salvation. He received eternal life. I thought about that. Did Jesus know that he healed ten? He didn't have to ask that question. He knew that answer, didn't he? Where's the other nine? Where's the other nine? Did not all ten of them get healed? It shows the difference in people. It shows a difference in the heart of man. The one was thankful. Apparently the other nine not so much so. Amen. You know, this man, he came just like the other ten for the main sole purpose of being healed physically didn't he but because of his thankful heart and his gratitude and he seen Jesus as God he knew that this blessing he knew this healing had to come from God it couldn't have come from anybody else there was nowhere else to get a healing like this it was unheard of but in his heart and his mind he is so appreciative and so thankful that he turned around and he praised God and he fell down upon his face and he cried out to Jesus. Physical healing is a great blessing, but it ends at death while the blessing of eternal life lasts forever. Amen? He got a whole lot more than he ever planned on. Jesus asked, where's the ten? Where's the... I cleansed ten, but where's the other nine? I'm sorry. The other nine did not give thanks. They went on living their life for themselves. Salvation wasn't their concern. They didn't stop what they were doing or where they were going or even give a thought to where this blessing, this miracle came from. But note this, they did return to the former world, the lives they knew, less Jesus Christ. Christ expects us to return to him continually, to return and glorify and worship him as a source of our power and strength for life. You know, as I read this story and it speaks volumes to me, you think about how many people that God blesses in this country, in this world today, rather they're saved or not, he provides for, and they never look up and know where it comes from. Amen? Amen. Children of God, people that give a profession of faith and no doubt they're saved. And they go right back out into the world just like those nine lepers. They forget where their blessings come from. Never thankful. Never appreciative. As a child of God, God provides for me and my family every day. Amen? He does you too. 
There are so many ways you could apply this in your life. We'll get so much, and yet we're never content. The Bible says, be ye therefore content with the things that you have. How many people, this has been Thanksgiving week, how many people has drove for miles, they've gone on airplanes and flew to see people and do things. All the things, all the money that's been spent, all the things that's went on, and yet people will forget to look up and thank God. We should be ashamed. Those nine lepers should have been ashamed. Can you imagine the condition that they were in? Their flesh rotting, they stunk. They, their flesh was rotten and oozing. And the misery and the hurt and the neglect and to be healed and the source that just healed them they turned her back on. How sad it is. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Is that not the times that we're in today? It's so sad, but it's so true at the condition of the heart of man in our society today. We live in the best country in the world. We live in the most wonderful country. Yes, it's not what it used to be. It's not what it could be. But if you don't like it, move out. Find you another home. Find you another country. If you don't like it here, those other countries out there will take you. Go try that. I guarantee you, you'll want to come back. We're blessed above and beyond. It's time that this country looks back up as a whole and praises a sovereign God. Amen? Amen. Our Constitution, our laws was uh, penned off of biblical principle, whether you want to believe it or not. And it's time. It's time that we stick up and we stand up for the things of God. Romans 1.21 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified God. Him not. As God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and her foolish heart was darkened. When you read that verse, it sounds a whole lot like people today. Amen. Amen. They don't want to glorify God. They won't take, we won't take the word of God out of the courthouse. We won't take it out of public places. We can't say uh, certain words because it offends somebody. It's real sad when, uh, when your daughter comes home and says, I've got a classmate, I've got a roommate that says that it's against her religion for you to put anything holy for Christmas up in this facility. That's what you're dealing with, folks. People turn away from holiness. They turn away from God in this country. We ought to be ashamed. We ought to be ashamed. People are not thankful. People have become vain in their imaginations. How terrible it is that you think that you could just do what you want and think what you want and believe what you want and yet you think that God's going to let you into heaven. You're foolish in that. Amen. You're foolish in that. Very foolish. But the reasoning for that, it says a foolish heart, it was darkened. Listen, Done a message here a while back from right here. It's dangerous to know God. If you don't want to live up to your calling and you don't want to do right, then it's dangerous. People that hear the word of God and they harden their heart to what God is trying to tell them, then it's, it becomes, uh, there's people that are lost, that, uh, that their heart is so hardened they don't hear the truth anymore. They're never under conviction. These verses seem to describe humanity in our day as well. The other nine lepers were healed, but they were not saved. Thankfulness should be in the Christian's heart today. We go to church to worship our Lord, giving thanks, giving testimony of God's blessing and the blessings that he does in our life. Do you realize that when we're thanking God and we're, we're being thankful, it's an act of worship? Where does our blessings come from as a child of God? From our Lord, amen. We should praise him. Our life should dictate that. It should show that. It should manifest that. Many believers will go to church, but they'll never testify Jesus Christ or anything he's done in their life. I could ask for praise reports or testimonies. Has God done anything in your life this week? Has he provided for you? 
Has he taken care of you? Has he forgiven you of sin that you've done and wrong things that you've done? Has he done anything in your life? Has he protected you? Has he provided for your needs? It's our part to worship him in giving thanks to him. About the only thing that we give God and can give God is thanksgiving. Why? Because we don't have anything to give him. What can I give God? What can you give God? You don't have anything. You think, well, I've got clothes on my back. God give them to me. They're really not mine. I'll guarantee you when I breathe, uh, exhale for the last time, I'm not taking these clothes with me. Not that anybody would want them anyway. But we don't own anything. We don't have anything other than what God has given us. Amen. Our material things, your money, your wealth, your homes, your vehicles, even your children. Yes, I have two daughters. Yes, you may have children. Yes, you may have grandchildren. But you know what? They belong to God. We were the only avenue to bring them into the world. They're really not ours. We just have the blessing and the responsibility to raise them in the admonition of the Lord. Amen. Everything that we have belongs to Him. We should glorify Him. We should be thankful for everything in our life. Do we do that? No. Do you do that? No, you don't. I know you don't. And you know what? I don't either. This, this message should trigger us every day to, to go to bed thankful, to get up thankful, and to thank Him every moment during the day that you can. Amen? Amen. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the things that's not going your way. Let me ask you this morning, are you like the one leper that was thankful, that turned back and praised God? Or are you more like the nine that just kept going your way? Those nine was basically saying, oh, it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. I'm not going back there. I'm, I'm healed now. Ain't no need me going back. I'm healed, I'm taken care of, I've got what I want. That's basically the, the attitude they have. I got what I want, I went to get healed, he healed me and I'm done, I'm out of here, I'm going to go do what I want to do. That's not a very grateful, not a very thankful attitude toward God. Amen. Let me ask you this morning, are you very grateful, are you very thankful? Let me tell you something, if you're here and you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you got everything in the world to be thankful for. Amen. Thank him. Thank him for your salvation. Thank him that Jesus died on the cross to pay your sin debt. John 3, 16, everybody knows that verse. For God so loved the Lord that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He provided salvation for us. Romans 3, 23, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. For the wages or penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Does those verses mean anything to you this morning? But God commanded his love toward us, and that yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Why does God love you and I so much that he did that for us, for me, for you? He looked past our sin. He looked past our unthankfulness. He looked past our selfishness. He looked past our sin and seen us for who we are, his creation. He loves us. And he wanted to redeem us back to himself. And he offers us salvation. It says that if thou wilt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Can you remember doing that? I remember doing that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do I have anything to be thankful for? You better believe it. I'm not going to hell. No, everything ain't the way I would like for it to be in my life, but I'll tell you what, it makes no difference. I've got a sovereign God. I've got the Holy Spirit within. I've got eternal life. It doesn't get any better than that, amen? amen. Yes, this life's going to pass by. Yes, there's going to be more loss. Yes, there's going to be hurt. Yes, there's going to be circumstances that I don't want. There's circumstances you don't want that you wouldn't wish on anybody. 
But there's promises of God that I can lean on. He promised he'll never leave us or forsake us. He, he's going to take care of us. He's going to meet our needs according to his riches and glory. I have every reason in the world to be the happiest person in this world. If you're a child of God, you have no reason to complain. You have no reason to complain. God's taking care of you. And he's, Jesus went to prepare a place that where he is, you may be also. Yes, this is going to pass away. Yes, it might get ugly before we leave here. But we have a promise of a perfect land that we're going to called heaven as a child of God. Amen. We are to be the happiest people on planet earth. Yes, our country's not what it could be. Yes, the economy's no, not what it could be. Yes, there's a lot of evil and wickedness in our world today. But if you've got Jesus Christ, you've got everything you need. Amen. But maybe you're here this morning and you can't claim that. Maybe you've not claimed these salvation verses. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to save you. Acts 4, 12 says, Neither is there salvation any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Let me ask you this morning in closing as the pianist comes, what's your need this morning? I don't know what your need is. Has God spoke to your heart? Are you here and you're lost and you've been putting it off and putting it off and you're trying to deny it and you're trying to be big boy or big girl and you're just going to tough it out another service, another day or until you get things the way you want? Listen, you're never going to get that. You're going to come God's way when God calls you and the only thing you can do is say, yes, I want your salvation. Yes, I want to be saved. Yes, I want to live my life for, for you, Lord. Yes, whatever you want to do. Maybe you're here and you're saved. God is calling you out for whatever reason. Maybe you need to, to be more committed. Maybe you need to be a church member. Maybe you need to be baptized. I don't know what your need is. I don't know what God's telling you. But now's your chance to respond. Either you will or you won't. Either you're going to or you're not. Maybe you're not very thankful and you need to do something. What's your need? Stand to your feet as she plays through.